Morning, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan and, and the organizers for this uh, nice invitation to come here. The plan is to talk about, as I said, one of my hobbies, which is science, science in the movies, okay? And we are going to do that by, you know, having a look at uh, what we have around us. Uh, I mean, let me emphasize that we live in a, in a high-tech uh, society, okay? From the moment that we wake up, uh, we are surrounded by technological gadgets, okay? So everybody at home, I, I presume, has a mobile, a laptop, a laser weapon, a lightsaber, okay? So these are the type of gadgets that we have around. And let me mention that aside from probably this group, which is deep, uh, deeply rooted in technology, most of our society relies on, so on society but frequently ignores everything about science and technology. And a good example we'll see today is what happens in the movies. Movies usually take care about historical accuracy and things like this. However, unfortunately, the same emphasis is not put into, you know, uh, delivering to the public an accurate enough uh, movie from the uh, technological and scientific viewpoints, okay? To the extent that usually I have the feeling when I go to a movie theater and I see, a, for instance, a science fiction uh, movie, when I, when I leave the room, I have the feeling I'm a replicant from Blade Runner because the first, sen the first sentence that comes to my mind is this one. I have seen things you people wouldn't believe, okay? It's incredible. It's basically the same thought I have when I'm grading quantum physics exams in the university. I have seen things that you wouldn't believe, okay? <laughs> anyway, so today we're going to embark into a journey. So let me just travel back in time to the 17th century, a sunny day in the English countryside where a young Isaac Newton, that probably sounds familiar to most of you, was actually looking at, the, at, the, at uh, under a, a tree how an apple was falling, okay? Well, many English people, what they would do is to, to, to try to make use of that and maybe even to consider the possibility to make cider out of this apple. Okay, but Newton was a different character, so instead of doing cider, he was interested to know where, why objects fall into the ground, and actually was the first to depict the famous law of universal gravitation, okay? That as a bottom up, uh, as, a, as a side effect, led us to an important uh, concept that's the only important concept that we need for this talk, which is the concept of escape velocity. That's the minimum speed at which you need to instantaneously give to, give to a body in order to, uh, uh, for the body to escape from the Earth's gravitational pull, okay? And there is that number, I mean, forget about the formula, it's bar barely visible in that screen anyway, but the idea is that the important message is that if you want to, you know, uh, escape from the gravitational pull on our planet, you, you plug in that formula, the values for the, for, for the Earth, radius and mass and so on, and the number that you get, that's the relevant number, that's the velocity that you need to leave our planet, okay? It's about 11 kilometers per second, okay? Which transform into more, you know, uh, user-friendly units, uh, you know, kilometers per hour, that corresponds to 40,000. 40,000 kilometers per hour, okay? So that, that's why that smells technology a lot, okay? And that's why astronautics, the science that actually deals with space travel, is uh, relatively uh, a new uh, area in, 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 in our society, okay? Remember that the Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, was launched only 60 years ago, okay? Well, armed with that concept, we are ready to embark in the first stage of this travel, and we are going to go from the Earth to our closest object that we have around, the Moon, okay? Uh, well, that's a, that's a view of, uh, you know, a photograph of our planet and the Moon. The distance that we need to cover is about 380,000 kilometers, okay? But, you know, this is an important issue, uh, and even though we have, we have seen, uh, even before the invention of, of the cinema, atoms to explain how can we go to the moon one day uh, using things that today will sound hilarious, like using a balloon or using a helicopter to go to the moon, okay? Well, we know today that the main issue, the main problem about reaching the moon is the following one. So we are somehow here, okay? I think it's barely visible with that screen, but there is... Here at the, at the edge of the Earth, there is a bluish line that, as I said, barely visible in that screen. It's perfectly visible on the laptop, however. 
I mean, this is basically the width of the uh, Earth's atmosphere. It's about 100 kilometers, okay? So that's the region that surrounds us in which we have basically air to breathe and to fly through, okay? However, as I said before, the distance that we need to travel through is much, much larger than that. Actually, 100 kilometers is, is, barely neg is negligible compared with the real distance that we have to, to travel through vacuum. And that was what makes a hell of a difference when you, you need to, uh, you know, to think about a mechanism that should work uh, in order to you know, uh, launch uh, you know, uh, uh, well, whatever the artifact through space. Okay? Most of the mechanisms that people invented in the past are similar to the mechanisms that we use today to fly throughout our atmosphere, but they will not work at vacuum. Okay? So during many years, actually centuries, people speculated with the possibility of whether we finally will be able to, to uh, you know, obtain a technology to reach the moon, or is it was just a dream. Okay? One of the guys that actually worked on that was a, a scientist, a chemist, Alexander Vickerton, who in the 20th of last century actually speculated about the possibility of reaching the moon. Actually, he concluded that the, this was an impossible dream. So let me, you know, for this highly qualified audience, evaluate more or less the argument of Mr. Bickerton. While he was, to make a long story short, he was mentioning that basically to escape the gravitational pull from the Earth, we need a velocity of seven miles per second. That's the 11 kilometers per second I was mentioning, so we are going well. And then he was w considering the following thing. Imagine a gram of material, a very tiny spaceship, only one gram in mass, okay? And so if I want to, uh, you know, push this gram of material at the scale velocity at, 100, uh, at 11 kilometers per second, the total energy this gram of material will need to carry is about uh, 15,000 uh, calories, okay? But he was wondering the following. I mean, imagine I take that this gram of material is made of the most powerful explosive that was known at the epoch, nitroglycerin. Okay? So if I explode one gram of nitroglycerin, even if it, this gram has nothing to carry, uh, what would be the energy delivered? Well, the energy delivered is, is, is written here in the slide. It's 1,500 calories, so just 10% of the energy needed to escape from the gravitational pull. So the, uh, the argument of Mr. Bickerton was, well, if I only get, you know, if, even if I have nothing to, to carry, to transport with me, if I only get 10% of the total energy that I need to uh, escape from the gravitational pull, that means that the space travel is impossible. Okay? Good. So it's time to make a face palm. Okay? Actually, a double face palm, because there are two important mistakes in the argumentation that Mr. Bickerton is, is giving us. Okay? First, as, you know, as science and technology progress, we have today uh, substances that are uh, much more uh, energetic, with, with a high expressive power than nitroglycerin. But the, the other important message is that Bickerton makes a wrong use of the concept of escape velocity. Probably you are familiar with the launch of some spaceships, in particular the now retired space shuttle, uh, uh, which you know, uh, probably you have seen that through TV or, uh, or YouTube or some of these uh, 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 places. The idea is that you know, there is a, a fascinating countdown that actually was invented in science fiction in one of the movies from the 40s. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And hopefully for the, for the, for the crew of the spaceship, the, the, the whole thing doesn't move at 11 kilometers per second instantaneously, otherwise they will die. Okay? So what happens instead is that, well, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the shuttle is there on ground. There's a lot of, uh, you know, smoke and so on coming from the exhaust of fuel, okay? And the idea is that progressively we see that the whole spaceship is moving, is ascending, okay? Actually, after uh, 50 seconds, the velocity of the space shuttle is just one kilometer per second, so about 10% of the required velocity. And it takes about nine minutes at the full, uh, you know, with the full usage of the, of the fuel of this space shuttle to actually reach escape velocity. So the trick for, space, uh, for, for, for leaving the Earth is not to provide instantaneously 11 kilometers per second to a, to a, a spaceship, it's just to uh, equip the, the spaceship with fuel such that we can gain progressively velocity and at some point we will end up reaching escape velocity. That's why in the case of the space shuttle we have such big uh, tanks of fuel compared with the ha in, uh, inhabitable uh, region of the, uh, what the, you know, the, what the crew members are actually uh, seated.
something important that I put in there on the slide is that what happened, what are the, uh, the crew members feeling during launch? Okay? Well, basically, all this is coordinated in a way that the mean acceleration that anybody, any, any living uh, being uh, on board of the shuttle, uh, will we'll notice, in, uh, you know, in average, something like three times the Earth gravity. Okay? That means that if you put an astronaut on a scale, just to determine your weight during launch, your weight will, will be increased by three. Okay? So if your weight is, say, 70 kilograms, you will see that the scales is actually pointing at 210 kilograms during launch. Okay? Obviously, when you are uh, under microgravity conditions, the scale tells you something quite different. Okay? But it is important because humans do not resist well the uh, exposition to large accelerations. Okay? Just let me uh, give you a couple of numbers. Okay? We know that from, uh, actually from, from uh, space travel, but also from supersonic uh, terrestrial uh, flights. Okay? And actually, we know that at 3 Gs, just at three times our, uh, you know, the gravity that we are exposed uh, regularly, what happens, and this is a complicated issue, and it depends much among the uh, location of the, of the body with respect to the, to, to the direction of acceleration of your spaceship. Okay? But in average, let's say that at 3 Gs, what happens is that our blood, the blood in our bodies tends to concentrate in specific regions of our, of our body. Okay? That means that the usual irrigation that we get uh, you know, gets heavily distorted to the extent that uh, one of the areas that you know, uh, get a reduced amount of blood, so the, the blood pressure decreases in that particular spot, is the retina, is our eye. Okay? That provokes some sort of uh, blurry vision. Okay, we, we can even, that could even uh, lead to some vision loss okay, that astronauts can suffer simply because your eye do, do not get the necessary uh, you know, amount of blood. Okay? Clear? Well, at 6 Gs, the situation gets even worse because now it's no longer the retina, it's the brain that is not uh, sufficiently irrigated. And remember that the blood is the, is the vehicle that we use as uh, humans to actually communicate or uh, transport oxygen to everywhere around our body. Okay? So a uh, brain without, uh, without uh, blood means brain without oxygen, and this is deadly. Actually, this can provoke, in a matter of about one minute or so, the, uh, uh, that the, uh, you know, whoever is exposed to those accelerations can get unconscious. Okay? And if that you know, continues, that can be fatal. We can actually uh, die because of that, uh, of that situation. So that's what will happen to every single human, except for Bruce Willis. Okay? We'll see that Bruce Willis magically found a way to escape that, that, that situation. And I don't know whether you have seen Armageddon. Okay? Again, I have many things to say, little time, so I will have to skip things. In Armageddon, well, there is this guy that suddenly uh, one day is recruited to uh, actually uh, face a menace that is actually approaching our planet. Actually, somebody discovers just uh, 18 days before impact that an object the size of Texas, okay, so you go to Wikipedia to check for the size of that, that's about 1,000 kilometers, is pointing toward Earth. Okay? And if an object the size of Texas is pointing toward Earth and it collides, well, Say goodbye to your best friends, okay? Because that would be all. Just as an example, if you go to Arizona, there is a wonderful place to visit. Actually, there's the meteor crater. It's this big hole in the middle of nowhere, hopefully, okay? That actually represents the hole left by a, by a rock that was only 50 meters, 50 meters in size, okay? Yeah, just to give you a flavor, you can go down. It's a fascinating experience, especially in summer, okay? So you can go there. And actually, you can realize that that's a big hole. Actually, the depth of that hole, of that crater, is 175 meters. Okay? The diameter is 1.2 kilometers. Okay? Remember that the size of the original rock was 50 meters. So then somebody may, may be thinking, how the hell a rock of 50 meters can make a hole of one kilometer, right? Well, again, because not everything is size. Okay? Energy plays a role in here. When an object falls, the minimum velocity that a, uh, an object will have corresponds to the escape velocity. The same, uh, the same thing that prevents us to escape actually accelerates in the infall an object. Okay? So the idea is that the, uh, you have a rock of 50 meters 
falling, I mean, impacting the ground at the escape velocity at 40,000 kilometers per hour, and the energy it liberates instantaneously goes into heat, and part of this heat efficiently melts the rocks surrounding, and that's why we generate a hole of 1.2 kilometers. Okay? Well, you can scale that. There are scale laws that describe what will happen for a 1,000-kilometer big rock, okay, like in Armageddon. And I don't, I don't want to, you know, to ruin your conference. I will not tell you about it. Okay? But that's a very bad thing. Okay? So, but don't worry. Bruce Willis is in it. Okay? And so he's uh, immediately trained to do something. Actually, he had a very bad idea. We can make a, like a conf full conference only on Armageddon, okay? because there are so many mistakes that I was, I was getting white in the movie theater. Actually, they plan to, to, to take you know, the biggest nuclear weapon that we have on Earth, okay? 100 megatons, and to uh, dig a hole into the asteroid just 100 meters, okay? because, well, you know, I mean, uh, you need, uh, it's not that easy to make a, to dig a hole into an iron nickel meteorite, actually, okay? Well, the idea is that they make a 100 meter uh, hole, they put the bomb, and then they leave, okay? Well, if you do that, basically what you get is nothing, okay? Actually, I made the math, okay? Well, that's what happens when you know some physics. I made the math, and I calculate, calculated how many 100 megaton bombs you need, actually, to break completely an asteroid like that, and these are millions of millions of millions of bombs like that. So actually, ma many more bombs than what we have in any arsenal on Earth, okay? So there's no way to, to, to crack an asteroid like that. Anyway, so just let me mention one sentence from that movie that actually impressed me. Actually, when after they dig the hole in the asteroid, they want to leave quickly, and actually from the uh, control mission, they tell the astronauts, you will need to accelerate at nine and a half gravities during 11 minutes. It's time to pray. I agree, okay? <laughs> I agree. Only a miracle will save you guys, because I mentioned that you know one minute, two minutes at 6G could be moral. So imagine 11 minutes at 9.5 G. Well, maybe Bruce Willis, that's why he has made so many movies, OK? But if I do that, I would die, for sure. Good. Now, let's go to the other side. What happens if we reduce gravity? Okay? That's what, basically, we are more uh, familiar with, because we have people uh, you know, flying around the Earth in the International Space Station, for instance. And so we are familiar with the, uh, with the symptoms of weightlessness in, in, uh, on the human body. Okay? Well, let me just mention something funny. Imagine that you have, your dream has always been to be a little bit taller. Okay? A little bit taller. Well, you can go and spend quite some time on the International Space Station, and you will grow about five centimeters. Okay? Well, simply because, well, remember that our body is articulated in terms of, uh, well, by, by a number of vertebrae that we have here uh, on the back, right? And these vertebrae can relax or contract depending on the environmental conditions, okay? Under high gravity, the vertebrae actually get closer, so you get uh, smaller. Okay? On space, where actually gravity, I mean, you are under in uh, microgravity conditions, uh, basically the vertebrae just relax at the maximum distance between uh, them, translates into a growth of about five centimeters. Actually, unfortunately, you lose them as soon as you are back on Earth and you spend, you know, a couple of weeks uh, among us again. Well, aside from this funny feature, all the other features are complicated. We don't know the extent, because the maximum time an astronaut has been flying around is about one year. Okay? We don't know what will happen if somebody spends uh, 5, 10, 20 years un under microgravity conditions. Okay? But all what we can say by now is that for reasons that we don't know, astronauts suffer some sort of uh, aging accelerated aging, even if you, and you send a 20-year-old guy as an astronaut, he will age like an old person. And one of the first sim uh, symptoms of that is what is called space flight osteopenia, which is basically the loss of calcium in, in your bones. Actually, that's the reason why elder people, when they fall, can, can have a larger probability of breaking an arm or a leg, because basically, when you get old, the uh, bones lose uh, large amounts of calcium. Okay, so a, a similar phenomenon can occur, and probably you have seen images of people coming back after a long time on space, and they are seated. Well, it's not that they are so tired after the trip. It's because probably their bones are, you know, weak, uh, and they have lost some calcium. So just to prevent that, you know, that you, you arrive on Earth, and then, wow, you break a leg immediately. That would be unfair, okay? So that's why they are seated. 
Uh, there are other issues related with the uh, uh, reduction, the slowing of the heartbeat, uh, the decrease of the production of red blood cells, which uh, translates into awakening of the immune system, muscle atrophy, because under microgravity conditions, what the hell you need? Your muscles, okay? They are useless. And the most famous one that tells you something about the humor at NASA is the so-called space adaptation syndrome, which, careful, these are the vomits that half of the astronauts that have been trained severely suffer during the first two or three days in space. Ah, probably you don't know that, and you have never seen that, oh, we are connecting with International Space Station, then ugh, there's somebody throwing up, because, again, that, that's cut from the uh, images, okay? But, again, 50% of the trained astronauts suffer that, and this is due to that disorientation, because, again, what, what's, uh, uh, things like north and south or up and down have no meaning under microgravity conditions, okay? NASA have coined a, a unit. You know that physicists love units, okay? And NASA has coined the GARN units to describe your degree of space adaptation syndrome. And you may wonder, where is this GARN units coming from? Actually, there was a US senator, okay, one of these politicians, that was sent up to explore, to visit the International Space Station. And apparently, apparently he's the record holder of the uh, uh, space adaptation syndrome. He spent the whole journey just vomiting. Okay? And so, NASA people have, have uh, qualified that as one garn, because the guy was called, I think, Jake Garn. Okay? So if you have one garn, that means that you will have a very bad time uh, on board. Okay? Half a garn means that, well, from time to time you have some vomits close to zero. That means that you will have a wonderful experience just you know, taking pictures and everything. And, yeah, if you still dream about being an astronaut after that, let me mention that actually among the uh, additional uh, issues, uh, uh, astronauts suffer sleep disturbance, excess flatulence on board. So the smell about the IAS must be something, we, uh, if you combine vomits and that, that would be incredible, right? Anyway, and uh, there are hints, that's not that clear, but there are hints about brain deterioration and early Alzheimer actually push by the uh, exposition to low gravity. Again, these are effects that we don't know actually to which extent, because as I said, the maximum time somebody has been there is one, one year, okay? Well, I will skip the experiments with the spiders. That's a very interesting one. If you have the, the, the occasion to search in YouTube for one of these experiments, you will see how a spider gets adapted to space. Okay? Actually, the poor, the poor spider, nobody has told her that you know, you, uh, she will be under microgravity conditions. So what a spider does, it creates a web actually by combining uh, her ability to actually jump at a specific speed reach the destination point, and then, you know, create this uh, silk uh, web, right? But again, if you are under microgravity conditions, uh, basically when you launch, there is not, 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 not a, mo a parabolic movement anymore, okay? So you just launch, and then you, ah, oh! and then you end up most likely on the other side of the cabin, okay? So that's what's going on. It's like you have gi been given a gin tonic to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the spider, right? Well, at the end, actually, the spider managed to find, to adapt to the environment, and Again, uh, the, I mean, the brightness doesn't allow to see that clearly, but this is the web that this spider, Arabella, was, uh, was actually uh, v uh, v able to, to build uh, uh, in one of the Skylab uh, models uh, in the 70s, okay? Good. So how can we find these uh, side effects of, micro of, uh, of microgravity conditions? One is this one, okay? It's the... Uh, uh, 2001 already showed up that using uh, structures that rotate, actually you can end up walking through the interior of some of these spaceships, okay? And uh, this is, uh, for instance, in a more recent movie in The Martian, uh, where people actually using these uh, circular structures, people, maybe you can see a guy there running, okay? So training, trying to... to, uh, to uh, to cheat your body about the uh, presence or, or the, the, to the fact that uh, you are currently under microgravity conditions. So in order to, uh, to avoid that, do exercise. Uh, doing exercise on a space station seems to be a good solution. Good. Talking about the Martian will lead us to the next stage in this talk, which is uh, to talk about Mars. Well, Mars is a fascinating des destination. You know that we have plans to go to Mars. Every U.S. administration from time to time is always saying, well, we'll get to Mars in 20 years from now. Okay? 
Now you will discover why 20 years and not during their time. Okay? Because there are, there, are, there are secrets that people uh, usually do not tell in public. Okay? Good. Uh, maybe you have seen that movie, John Carter. Well, this is unfair, because that movie is based on a series of novels, uh, actually about this guy, John Carter, which is a human guy that one day suddenly uh, wakes in, uh, in, in Mars. Okay? He doesn't know exactly how, but he's one day in Mars and says, what, what, what the hell am I doing here? Okay? Anyway, well, th they, these novels were written 100 years ago, and by then the knowledge about Mars was quite limited. Okay? Today is not perfect, but we know that there are things that cannot really happen in Mars. For instance, in the movie, for those that have seen that, the main character, this guy, John, the, the, the human, the John Carter, can make incredible jumps. Why? Because he's in Mars, my friends, okay? Actually, he's, I mean, in the movie they justify, well, you know, the gravity is small in Mars, so you can jump more because you come from, an from another planet and you're used to do these things. Fine, let's do the science of that. Imagine that without any, you know, impulse, I, I just jump vertically without, without running, okay, vertically. If I'm in a very good day and train and so on, basically the sole of my feet can actually elevate by about half a meter, 50 centimeters, you know, something like this, okay, from the ground, okay? Well, maybe somebody that plays basketball will say, oh, I, I can do 70 centimeters, fine, wonderful, it's just an estimate, okay? What would be the effect if that same person jumps in the same way on Mars? Well, the change, uh, the, the gravity factor that tells you, uh, you know, the difference between the Earth and Mars is, is about a factor of three. That means that on Mars, gravity is three times smaller than on Earth. Okay? And that translates in a jam that would be this, this thing multiplied by the, the change in gravity, so three. Okay? The, all in all, that means that the distance from my feet to the you know, to ground, if I jump on Mars, would be something like 1.3 meters. Fine, good, I mean a good jam, right? But nothing like this. Okay? So in the movie, he can even catch spaceships by jam jumping. Well, again. Well, there's other, another thing, water on Mars, okay? Well, yeah, we have found water on Mars, actually, okay? But it's not as uh, impressive as, th as that. We found some ice in one crater that is not really highly uh, uh, illuminated by the sun, okay? And that makes into the headlines. We have found water on Mars, okay? And probably you have seen that if you are old enough, like 20 times. For the first time, we have found water on Mars. Then next week, for the first time, we have found water on Mars. It's a different picture, okay? Well, actually, you can find nice pictures of that if you Google water on Mars. You can see things like this. You can also see things like this, okay? That's also water on Mars, but it's a different type, type of thing. Good. Talking about water, there are other things that you can do on Mars, okay? Talking about liquids, yeah. You, you can feel like a superhero somehow on Mars or in the moon in places where the gravity is small because you can reach farther. Even though it's a miserable superpower, you think about it. Imagine that you go to a, to a, I mean, to a party with your friends and people ask you, so what's your superpower? I can pee very far away. Well, that's not the type of superpower you can think of. Well, there are many superpowers that you can think of, okay? And unfortunately, I don't have much time to go into the, th those. I would love to talk about Hulk, the, the Flash, Spider-Man, Batman, many others, the Avengers, which superpowers they have and what the physics have to do about it. So I will just focus on one, okay? Superman, okay? Well, Superman, remember, was, uh, as many other superheroes, appear for the first time in the movies. Actually, that's the first appearance of Superman in a, mo in a comic from 1938. In the early movies, to the best of my knowledge, Superman couldn't fly. Okay? Again, that was the case of John Carter. He was coming from another planet, Krypton, and he could, he could do incredible jams. Since we don't know the gravity in Krypton, it's hard to criticize. Okay? But again, that was an interesting move. Okay? Well, if you come from a planet where the gravity is larger than on Earth, maybe when once you are on Earth, you can jump more because you are used to that and so on. Okay? Your bones are you know, specific uh, configuration and so on. Suddenly, in one comic, somebody decided, well, if this guy can jump so much, why, why he cannot fly? Okay? Which is a slightly different, okay? because in order to fly, you need uh, to have uh, other qualities. You cannot change direction when you are jumping like this, and then you go like that without any uh, engine or anything like this. Okay? That would violate many physical laws. Just let me mention about one of the aspects that I found surprising about Superman. His ability to, uh, to have x-ray vision. 
Okay? So he can spot many interesting things, thanks to his X-ray vision, in particular a cake okay, that is actually hidden into a, an oven. Okay? So be, because he has his wonderful eyes, he can go through whatever the, the, the metal except lead, okay? and then s spot the, the cake in there. Actually, for instance, in Superman Returns, we can see a, a, an example of that. He is investigating whether uh, his uh, friend Louis Lane has been actually affected by a fall, so he makes like a wonderful X-ray scan through her body, which is interesting because maybe she's okay, but after the, the doses of radiation that she will get, I would not be that, that sure, okay? That's one thing. Second thing is that, wonderful, I mean, what do you have in your eyes? If we turn off all the lights and we, I mean, this room becomes pitch black, okay? We'll not see a thing. We cannot, I mean, these are just detectors of radiation actually in the, in the range of visible light, right? We cannot emit X-rays. I mean, this is not an emitter, it's a detector, a simple detector like a CCD, okay? Well, again, that's Superman. He can do many things, okay? And one of the abilities that he has in case of travel, he can use his vision to actually melt dangerous objects falling onto the population. Okay, good. Yeah, we like to have those eyes. Anyway, talking about radiation, sorry I mean, that the slide is, is, uh, is not in English, but anyway, maybe you can see that figure. That's the only thing I would like to stress. When we talk about colonizing Mars, okay, people tend to forget something relevant, okay? And the relevant piece of information that people tend to forget is that Mars has two main differences with regard to planet Earth, okay? Mars is unprotected for the arrival of charged particles and high energy radiation. We have two shields that protect us. One is the Earth magnetic field, okay? Mars is smaller than the Earth. The, the reason why the Earth has a, a magnetic field that we use, you know, to orientate in the forest with a compass and so on, that's because part of the inner part of the, of the planet is actually uh, um, liquid. It's in liquid phase. We have liquid uh, plasma, okay, at high temperatures of the order of several thousand degrees, okay? And when you have a, a charged plasma that is liquid and can rotate, actually that translates into a, a, you know, a generation of magnetism, that's basic physics, okay? Well, in Mars, it's so small that actually it has solidified completely. It, has, it doesn't have a, a liquid core, and that translates into essentially a zero magnetic field. So any proton that uh, would be trapped around the Earth because of the magnetic field, and so we are protected from the arrival on Mars, will hit the ground, okay? So the doses of radiation would be larger. Second thing, we have an ozone layer that protects us from you know, ultraviolet radiation, high energy radiation, okay? On Mars, essentially there is no atmosphere. Okay, uh, we can go on and on and talk about the Martian. I mean, whether these huge storms that appear in the beginning of the Martian, if you have seen the movie, take place. Well, the answer is no. Okay, I remember I was, in the, I was watching the movie in the theater, first minute of the movie, and I said, I have seen incredible things. Well, you know the story, right? Anyway, so, well, I don't know whether you can spot here. There is a small peak here. Okay, that's the dose of radiation that somebody working on a nuclear power plant on Earth will, will receive in a year, okay? I'm excluding accidents, of course, okay? In a normal operation of a nuclear power plant. That's in one year. That thing is the expected level of radiation of a human on, uh, on a three-year mission on Mars, simply because of the lack of uh, exposure uh, of the lack of protection from a, uh, from a magnetic field and ozone. So that means that careful, I mean, one day we'll go to Mars, but we first need to provide a way to decrease the levels of expected radiation for the crew. Otherwise, they will, yeah, go to Mars, they will put the flag, and when they uh, come back, they will go directly to the hospital, okay? Anyway, so uh, uh, let me skip uh, to reforming things. Just let me mention that probably you have seen that movie. Here in this country, we have, we have a wonderful set of translators that usually they put, they, they add their grain of salt or usually to, you know, change something. So you have to remember, you have to do the extra effort to remember the original title of a movie and, and that that has been used in your country. Here, the th I mean, the deal was not that complicated, my God, because the original title was The Martian. Okay, that could, why they translated that into Mars, okay? 
It's not a, I mean, it seems like a documentary, Mars. I'm going to, 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 to the movie theater to learn something about Mars. The Martian tells you something else. Is there, is there any alien in the movie? Okay. It wasn't that complicated to translate the Martian into Marciano. That would be the Spanish word. Probably it was to avoid jokes like this. Okay. <laughs> That's the only explanation I found. Anyway. Good. OK, I have like. I have like six minutes. Let's go a little bit beyond. So let's, let's explore our galaxy. So one, a, a number of few questions, because otherwise at the end I, I, you will have to make a, a small exam to prove your training in this course. Well, Gravity has uh, the, the movie by, uh, by the Mexican Alfonso Cuaron actually illustrated us that moving throughout the space is not as simple. Okay? It's not enough like in Star Wars just take the steering wheel, you, you rotate that, and then the ship goes like this, okay? Basically, like, like piloting a, an airplane, okay? In space, you don't have friction, okay? So you need to do something else. And I don't, see where, I don't know whether you can see that. Well, yeah, this is basically what the space shuttle, in one of the movies directed by Clint Eastwood in Space Cowboys, he was using to illustrate how a spaceship moves uh, on space, okay? If you don't have friction, the only thing that you can do is you need to throw something in one direction, and by a physical principle that, some, that may be familiar to most of you, conservation of linear momentum, essentially, the idea is that uh, you know, the rest of the object moves, moves backward. Okay? The problem is that, yeah, it moves backward, but it doesn't stop because there's no friction, so you have to compensate that. So that's why an, an, uh, a, space, uh, a spaceship like the shuttle had two main engines at the rear to basically, uh, you know, uh, are responsible for changing orbit and so on, but also 44 micro thrusters distributed along the, uh, the structure, along the spaceship, to provide some mobility to the, uh, to the spaceship. This is not Photoshop, that's a real image, a carless astronaut in uh, extravehicular operation, okay? And thanks to the, uh, so, some backpack that is equipped with nitrogen micro thrusters, actually 24, he can move and, and return to the cabin. And we have seen, for instance, George Clooney in Gravity taking what appeared to be something else than an, an espresso by judging by the uh, random trajectories he's following. Probably he put something else in there. And uh, you can see how the backpack actually exhibits some, uh, some jets that actually, that's essentially the mechanism that we use to move. Uh, I didn't check whether the trajectory is correct, but that's the idea, okay? Good, uh, now an exam, okay? So the idea is I will show you one famous scene from uh, The Empire Strikes Back, it, 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 uh, it will last only for one minute. We'll see it twice. First, to get familiar with, and second, to actually spot how many mistakes or things that are scientifically inaccurate you will find. I tell you there are more than 10 in one minute, which is probably a record holder. Okay? Anyway, let's see that. Uh, what are you doing? You're not actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? You don't have to do this to impress me. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Longer. You can argue with that. Oh, I'm going in closer to one of the big ones. Closer? Closer. Yeah. Don't do nice. Excuse me, ma'am, but where are we going? 
Good. So I hope that you have already get familiar with the scene. Now it's time to see it again and identify possible possible mistakes. Han, look! Ah, oh, crap! There's two more of them dead ahead. It's all right. I think I can outmaneuver them. going into an asteroid field. Sir, the odds of successfully navigating an asteroid field are two to one. Never tell me the... Oh, uh, actually, that's not bad. Yeah, no, let's, let's keep going. Look, we got four or five of the main characters on this ship. I think we'll be fine. All right, let's park right there in that cave. What are you doing? You can't park there. You're not handicapped. I have vertigo. It's a real medical condition. I'm, I'm just going on record as saying I'm not comfortable with this. So the time is out. Let me finish with uh, one minute. Uh, uh, some, I mean, for purists that love the uh, Star, Star Wars uh, uh, several trilogies and so on, that would be like a terrible scene to finish, you know, with uh, identifying or pointing to Star Wars as a bad movie from the scientific point of view. Hopefully there are other movies that maybe deserve that title. So just very quickly, Starship Troopers, maybe you have seen that. Finally, the Earth has decided not to fight with each other, okay? And we decided to have fun with aliens, which are you know, maybe you feel better about uh, killing somebody else, okay? Well, the idea is that you are, we are here, which is that correct. I mean, this is our galaxy, and we live in the outskirts of our galaxy. That's correct. And we have found an enemy there, I mean, a little bit far away. Actually, if you calculate how far are they, well, maybe they are like 60,000 light years away from us, okay? Meaning that if you, you, you make an interplanetary war with them, 60,000 years, can you imagine? You send them a, a, a ship, they land on Tlendathun, that system, and suddenly you see, oh boy, they are, uh, they are stronger than I expected. So st I, I need more troops, okay? Well, this I need more troops will we'll travel at the speed of light and will reach the Earth 60,000 years away. There will be some military, you know, the stubborn people, at some point they will say, yeah, send them, send them, okay? Then that you will send the troops, and if they go with a relativistic a spaceship moving at the speed of light, something like 100,000 years before the first expedition landed, the, the uh, uh, ex-troops will arrive. Well, I mean, probably war has no meaning, but interplanetary war even less, okay, as you can see by these numbers. And my last slide, Independence Day. Wow, that would deserve also a monographic, okay? Just let me, as an astrophysicist, mention, this is my very last slide. Uh, there is a moment in which the main character that is uh, played by Will Smith and, and, and his wife are actually, uh, this, uh, I mean, are actually uh, having some sort of domestic battle because the wife is upset by something she has seen, okay? Actually, she has seen these huge spaceships landing or actually surveilling the main cities and so she's scared and the guy says well don't worry dear actually i really don't think they flew 90 billion light years to come down here and start a fight okay it's meaning that if you come from very far far away you have to be good people okay well let me object to that well actually that's what happens okay uh, the idea is that, well, I mean, ask, uh, you know, many ancient civilizations whether getting visits from uh, Europe were, were good at the time. Uh, we were coming from far away. But the important thing is that where are these 90 billion light years away? Actually, this is beyond the observable universe. Okay? So, 
I mean, I mean, put that in perspective. That means that the Earth is a special place. I mean, it must be there in all the planetary uh, travel guides, okay? Otherwise, how the hell they are coming here from a place that actually they have not get any signal emitted by, by any, uh, you know, uh, terrestrial, because in 90, uh, 90 billion light years, the, the, the universe has only 13 billion light years of age, okay? So light has never, didn't have time to reach that region. Okay? Actually, the important thing is that they are coming to visit us from a place that actually is not only beyond the observable universe, but it actually they initiated the trip to Earth before the Earth was created. Okay? So that makes an incredible trip. So let me be extremely thankful to these guys for coming and visit us. Okay? And uh, let me thank you all for your attention. <clears throat>